Good morning. Welcome to the 2021 Perkins Lecture Series. We are excited to start this week with today's 15th annual Perkins Lecture featuring Dr. Brenda Salter McNeil and partnering with University Ministries Chapel as we have done every year on this occasion. Other events to name of this week in the lecture series is a special panel partnering with SPU's Faculty Life Office on Wednesday called SPU Black Women Leading. And then we are hosting two opportunities for conversation with the Perkins family, one in the community with the CCDA's Pacific Northwest Network tomorrow, and one focused on student leadership on Thursday morning. We hope you will join us for all of these opportunities. Information can be found at spu.edu forward slash Perkins. For those wondering, my name is Kenesha Warren and I serve as the executive director for the John Perkins Center and Minister of Reconciliation Ministries as part of the University Ministry staff. This year's lecture series theme, Living into the Legacy, Women and Reconciliation, was born out of a vision that flickered in my mind as I watched the movie Harriet, released in November of 2019. In this film, there was a remarkable dialogue captured as the underground railroad leaders were trying to refigure out how to free slaves to safety, given a further distance of travel now that the road to freedom had moved further north. In the scene, as other leaders discounted the possibilities, Harriet spoke up, naming the fact that many of those in leadership had not experienced slavery firsthand. And given her direct experience in slavery, she named that there was no distance too far that she wouldn't go to continue bringing slaves to freedom. This scene gave me a sense of importance about the idea of a living legacy. And it tied to my understanding, growth, and development of our own John Perkins Center here at Seattle Pacific University. In it is rooted the living legacy of our namesake, Dr. John Perkins, whom we have learned from and are continuously drawing inspiration for the work of reconciliation from his life and living legacy. It is his direct experience of extreme economic and racial injustice in our country, impassioning him towards cultivating reconciliation in our communities. What I glean from its telling, this legacy story of an African and American man born of a sharecropper family in Jackson, Mississippi, a witness to racial hate intruding on his family with the death of his brother, fought for civil and voter rights alongside many, including college students, where he found himself brutally beaten to near death in the Brandon, Mississippi jail. This became the space where Dr. Perkins came out to say there was no fight too hard, that he would not work across sociocultural barriers to enliven reconciliation from within our gospel. I will invite Perkins Center staff, Ashley Thomas and Michael Chu to continue the story of Dr. Perkins, the story of living into the legacy. From Let Justice Roll On. People being people do not do anything with some, without some sort of reason. It may not be a very good reason, but there has to be a reason of sort. So I wondered, take Brandon for instance. The whole Brandon mess was something you wouldn't even dream people could do to each other, but they did. Why, for what reason? At first, the reasons weren't very clear, but after I was beaten by white policemen, I began to see things a little more clearly. I was able to see the needs of white people and what racism was doing to them. You see, I had gotten set to the fact that the sickness of racism had affected the black community in a way that kept them from functioning as a healthy community. A lot of our people are sick, affected by generations of slavery, oppression, and exploitation, psychologically destroyed. But I had never thought much before about how all that had affected whites, how they had been affected by racism, by attitudes of racial superiority, by unjust lifestyles and behavior. Now I wondered a lot. 
There was nothing special about Brandon, the Brandon beatings. There had been plenty more like them. And I mean beatings like this by police officers and highway patrol, not just by mobs. But why? For what reason? Hate did that to them. When I saw what hate had done to them, I couldn't hate back. I didn't want hate to do to me what it had already done to those men. From one blood, I had to make a choice. Would I allow my settled unforgiveness towards Mississippi whites to burn deeper into my soul or would I surrender to God's call to forgive? I was hurt and I was angry and I was caught in the struggle between the old man and the new man. When people spit in your face, it's nothing but the grace of God that keeps you from striking back. Revenge seemed fair and right. But I'm grateful to God because he kept me from making foolish decisions that would have most likely meant my life and possibly the life of my family. Instead, God pointed me in another direction towards forgiveness and love, and I still marvel at the course my life has taken. I'm often asked this question, John Perkins, why did you stay in the fight for social justice? Why didn't you give up? Most people would say I was committed to justice, but as I have grown in my faith, it's been more than that. I wanted to keep it within the gospel to fill those holes up that we pulled out. And I think when the Lord puts a fire in your belly and a call on your life, quitting isn't an option. But if we're able to stand and to remain committed, it's because of God's grace. Over the course of history, there have been a lot of folks that God has used to move the issue of reconciliation forward. Their stories of great faith are an encouragement to keep fighting. When it's all said and done, love is a choice. It's a decision. I choose the way of love. I've chosen to be marked by it. Dr. John Perkins. If all we know of ourselves is what we learned in history books, what we observe on the daily or nightly news or read online or in the newspapers, we are missing out on key information and stories about who we are as a people, as a nation. American textbooks were written with a specific bias that reinforces the systemic evil of white supremacy and racism. And for that reason, Dr. Person Perkins advised, we must become advocates for telling our stories to our children so that they understand the wealth of our history in this country. Living into our stories of truth, this is the legacy we give. And so our history in this particular place, this land, calls us to acknowledge that SVU and Seattle rest on the unceded lands of the Coast Salish people. That includes the home of tribes within the Duwamish, Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations, a native people whom bring honor to their heritage, respect to people, and from whom we must learn as leaders in honoring and caring for community and land. Now, I am a connector in thinking, and it has been in my own observation <laughs> in the past few years to have seen changes and transitions around me that is drawing into a current time, a time of women in our communities. From the 2006 Rio de Janeiro Olympics leading in black women medalists to more recently 2020 bringing women of color into seats of Congress and record numbers. And we can't forget the 2021 inauguration of the first women and women of color vice president. Even this week with women of color honors at the 2021 Oscars making many firsts. Coming into this academic year at SPU, I looked out onto our campus to see a unique moment of black women in leadership at one time, which is something we will highlight at tomorrow's lecture series panel events. When this vision was officially set into place last year in 2019, we chose to affirm and demonstrate value in the presence of women in leadership within the forward legacy of reconciliation work. Like Harriet and Dr. Perkins, in known ways our speaker, Dr. Brenda Salter McNeil is known and active, living into a legacy of her own when it comes to defining reconciliation work. 
She has transformed the ground and leading and changing communities into becoming reconciling spaces that bring hard work, the heart work, and looks to healing and hope. Reverend Dr. Brenda Salter Neal is a dynamic speaker, teacher, preacher, author, and a foremost reconciliation leader. She is daughter, sister, wife, auntie, friend, pastor, advocate, confident, and activator for justice. Her mission is to inspire and empower uh, emerging Christian leaders to be practitioners of reconciliation in their various spheres of influence. I, myself, have been blessed to be shaped, mentored, and pushed into opportunities of influence by Dr. Brenda Sal Salter McNeil for over 10 years now. I met her as a young, what do we say, emerging leader uh, when I started here at SPU at the yearly Ignite conference held by Salter McNeil Associates. In her book, Becoming Brave, as she describes the unlikely, even reluctant activist as Esther responds to Mordecai with, who me? And the passage reads, you may be reading this book, thinking the same kinds of thoughts. You want me to lead a movement of racial reconciliation on my campus? You want me to start a new racial reconciliation ministry at my church? Or you want me to share my experience? Or you want me to stand up for justice in my community? You may be wondering whether you have what it takes. And further, you may in fact be asking yourself, who me? Yes, all those things and all those questions was my who me. And while my relationship with Dr. B has been a series of who me moments that have come to shape the very leader that I am, I know for myself, uh, there is so much that I would not and still would not say yes to initially. But as I did say, Dr. B has shaped, mentored, and sometimes pushed me into becoming. Dr. B is an associate professor of reconciliation studies in the SPU School of Theology directing the Reconciliation Studies uh, minor program, which is an academic partner with the Perkins Center, aimed at preparing students to engage the culture and change the culture around them as Christian reconcilers. She holds a Master of Divinity degree from Fuller Theological Seminary, a Doctorate of Ministry from Palmer Theological Seminary, and was awarded Doctorates of Humane Letters from both North Park University and Eastern University. She is an ordained pastor in the Evangelical Covenant Church and on the pastoral staff at Quest Church here in Seattle. She is the author of Roadmap to Reconciliation 2.0, A Credible Witness, and The Heart of Racial Justice. Her newest book, Becoming Brave, became available in August of 2020 for such a time as this. Let me offer this video as well as introduction. I started writing a book about Esther and ended up writing a book about myself. The more I studied the biblical character of this ancient queen, the more I could hear echoes of Esther in my own life. Esther spent years concealing her true identity. She sought safety and assimilation to the dominant culture around her. It was an effective survival strategy until that one crisis moment when she was called to tell the truth, the whole truth about her story. Like Esther, we are living in a crisis moment and people's lives are under threat daily. Like Esther, I am compelled to speak regardless of the consequences I may face. No longer tempering my words to appease a white evangelical church. I must tell the truth, the whole truth about racial justice. This is a book about finding our courage. It is Esther's story. It is my story. 
and I hope that it will also inspire you to fully pursue your story. Imagine what would happen if we all decided to become brave. Well, I am moved so deeply, one, to be invited to be this year's lectureships speaker for this important event. I am also moved by the introduction of my life here at SPU, my partnership with Kanisha Warren and the John Perkins Center. It is one of the most life-giving things that has been a part of my professorship here. It gives me great joy and deep, deep gratitude to be able to be a part of the process of preparing young students who come to undergraduate and graduate school seeking God's purpose for their lives. And through the John Perkins Center and practical theology as a foundation of both an understanding of God's call to justice and reconciliation, and then the John Perkins Center giving people actual practice and putting their selves in situations that are transformative, we can now say that there are students all over the world who are living into the legacy of Dr. John Perkins. So it is with a great sense of joy and admiration and gratitude that I I'll greet you this day as your speaker for this lectureship. As I think about what we're talking about in this notion of becoming brave and why it is so necessary, I'm hoping that you, even as we begin this conversation together, will think about the world in which we're living, that we have been called to the kingdom for such a time as this. And as we think about the divisions and the social unrest and the, the racial tensions and the political divisiveness, we must ask ourselves, what is the role of the church? And that's when I lean back on the wisdom of my ancestors to answer questions that for me are new, situations that seem almost imaginable to me. I stand on the shoulders of ancestors who have gone through very difficult things and have taught us the way forward. Such is the case with the life of Dr. John Perkins. And so I'm here to tell you that I love the wisdom of my ancestors. I praise God for what I have learned from what they've taught me and what I've seen of them. Often their wisdom and their guidance is passed on to us in sayings and proverbs. We've heard them as a child, but we did not fully understand or appreciate them at the time. But now that we've become adults, it seems as if their wisdom and their guidance is brilliance. And we wished we had hung on their words more carefully when we were young. Such is the case with an African proverb that I heard many years ago but it has become much more dynamically profound within my soul for this time that we find ourselves in now. It simply but profoundly says this, the daughter of a lion is also a lion. You see, the wisdom of this saying is speaking to and affirming the strength and the courage of women and reminding all people that although the Bible has been misinterpreted to portray women as the weaker vessel, the truth is that God created women as warriors from the beginning. In fact, the Hebrew word for woman is ezer which is the term used twice in Genesis to refer to Eve as a helper or helpmate for Adam. However, that same word that we have used to call women weaker vessels, the helpers are actually, those words, that word is actually used also three times to refer to warriors, strong military forces, and 16 times to refer to God, Ezer. This word is a combination of two roots, one meaning to rescue and the other meaning to save. The other idea that is brought together in this conjunction is to be strong, Ezra. 
You see, just by hearing the etymology of this word, we can clearly see from the Hebrew origins that the full meaning of Ezer, a woman, is much more powerful than the traditional word helper, as we've had it translated, many of us from the time we were children. The interpretation has very much influenced the culture around us, has it not? and cause some women to question their own strength. That same kind of theological thinking has been exported around the world where women find themselves being demeaned and held down and kept from leadership. But the daughter of a lion is also a lion. That's why we must constantly be reminded that women are warriors that women are made in the image of God. The same word used for God is the same word used to describe the strength of women. This is especially important as we watch a new generation of Christian leaders take their prophetic place at the forefront of the reconciliation movement, noting that many of these emerging leaders are women. Because if I've said it once, I will say it over and over again. The daughter of a lion is also a lion. I became very consciously aware of this seeming interesting thing that's happening with women at a conference. I was the speaker there and there was a spoken word artist who I certainly admire. His name is Propaganda. And he and I were chopping it up behind stage uh, after he finished his set and I finished speaking. So we were just catching up. And I respect this young man very much. The profound things he says in spoken word, the way he pays attention to what's happening in the world around him informs me and makes me really very much listen carefully when he speaks. So as we were talking backstage, he said to me, you know what, Dr. Brenda, all of the prophetic voices who are primarily at the forefront of the reconciliation movement today are women. Have you noticed that? And I thought, huh, I'm not sure I paid that much attention. I think sometimes as women, we keep our heads down and do the work and are not necessarily paying attention to a trend, things that seem to be emerging over and over again. So as we kept talking, he said, yeah, my wife and I were watching and listening and talking, and we began to realize that the voices of women seem to be the source of the cutting edge prophetic energy that is pushing the reconciliation movement forward in this day. Now, I don't know if you've had a conversation with someone where you find yourself thinking about it long after the conversation is over. Such was the case for me after I finished talking to propaganda. As we finished our conversation, I mused on it. I thought about it. I began looking in my own mind and rehearsing the people that I'd heard and seen coming behind me. And sure enough, his analysis of the situation was accurate. Women are standing up. I began to understand that not just women in general, but especially women of color. I began to understand that women of color have a more acute understanding of the interlocking structures of oppression. And as a result, they are often at the forefront of justice movements and protests, declaring that Black lives matter and demanding that we say her name. The daughter of a lion is also a lion. We see this reality lived out all around the world, don't we? Women are rebuilding communities that have been devastated and destroyed by violence, war, genocide, political corruption, and economic injustice. Time does not allow me to talk about what's happening all over the world, Rwanda, Latin America, South Africa, Liberia, India. There are places around the world where women, despite their own trauma and despite their own pain, they have to demonstrate over and over again how they harness their strength and cultivate their leadership while managing their own grief 
tending to their own pain in order to connect across divides and create a new culture of peace, stability, and unity. I will never forget the South African mother who came to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and said publicly, I am not here for revenge. I just want to know where you laid my son. I'm not here for retribution. I am here for reconciliation. And I simply want to bury my son with dignity. That is the leadership of women in this day. In spite of gender inequality, the lack of education and economic resources, these women find themselves leading reconciliation efforts that reveal the true warriors that they really are. Oh, if I had time, I'd tell you about the women in Liberia who decided that they were going to pray the devil back to hell. That they saw Charles Taylor, a dictator who was beginning to use their children as child soldiers and they declared enough is enough. And they began to meet Muslim women, Christian women, all in solidarity together determining that you will not continue to destroy our children. We will pray the devil back to hell. Ah, the devil. If I could tell you that as a result of their movement, that regime was indeed toppled. Charles Taylor did go into exile and the next president of Liberia was a woman because the daughter of a lion is also a lion. You see this revelation of our bravery to fight for the good of the community is something that a young woman in scripture has had to discover for herself. You may know the story of Queen Esther in the book of Esther. She is called to take the risk to speak up and stand in solidarity with the oppressed to be brave enough to identify with her people, to use her influence and her access to take the message of the oppressed and translate it so that the people in power would understand what is happening to people outside the palace. For us, it would mean using our education outside the ivory towers of higher education and say to ourselves, we like Esther have been given access and influence. We have been given the ability to, to, to speak truth to power should we choose it. And like Esther, we will discover that this is a, a very challenging thing to be asked to do. Esther is being asked to risk her safety, her security, all that she has learned to watch out for herself regarding is now on the line. She has now have to make the brave decision to connect to the poor, to identify with those who have not, who do not have privilege, who do not have power, who do not have the comfort of the palace. She is going to have to find a way to garner her strength and her courage to speak to those who are wealthy and tell the truth about the way that people's lives are being dehumanized and being destroyed outside the palace. Unjust laws have been passed and people are being disenfranchised in our country. It is true that voting rights are being repressed and turned back. It is true that certain people have had their children taken from them and they still do not know where their children are. It is true that children in Flint, Michigan are still drinking lead poisoned water. These things are true. And now like Esther, we must decide what we will do. You see, she understands now because Mordecai has caused her to read and become informed about what is happening outside the palace of her life. 
And the hope is that she would create an energy between the people with power and those without, connect them so that they would understand that they could identify with each other in their common humanity. So it doesn't have to be a political divide. This does not have to be choosing left or right. It's humane to care where someone's child is, period. It's humane for a mother to long to see an infant that was taken from her arms. It's just humane. It's what it would feel like to want for someone what I want for myself. I can remember as a mother with a young daughter who is now a young adult, I was in a grocery store and my back was turned and for some reason she saw something and toddled away from me. When I turned around, I didn't see my three-year-old. And I can only tell you that I went instantly on 10. I yelled for her. She was just an aisle over, but I couldn't see her. And the panic that I felt in that moment as a mother is what causes me to talk about children who have been separated from their parents at the border. Because I know what it feels like to look for your child, even for a second. I could not imagine years having not been able to see my Mia. This is what Esther's being asked to do, to put herself in a place where she can now be a bridge between the haves and the have nots, those who are hurting and those who have no clue what is happening to other people's lives outside of the palace. She is being asked to take the role of a translator or an ally who is able to speak into different socioeconomic realities, into different cultures, into different languages and ethnic identities to help the king see the people under his authority as fully human and also made in the image of God. That is what we too are being asked to do. Although she is scared and understands the consequences that can happen to her, she also knows that she is Mordecai's daughter. You see, this is a powerful thing for her to come to recognize. Mordecai is the person who told her not to tell anyone of your ethnic identity. Mordecai was the father who said, I want you to watch out for yourself. Be careful. I love you. I do not want any harm to come to you as you've been taken away from me and now find yourself in this palace in a Persian kingdom that you did not choose. So do not reveal your Jewishness. Do not let anyone know who you really are. And she followed his lead, but she's also grown up watching a father who has stood for God no matter what. And she now discovers for herself that the daughter of a lion is also a lion. She's Mordecai's daughter. Mordecai is the central figure who refuses to bow down and pay homage to a political leader named Haman. Haman wants people to worship him, to give him a sense of honor and praise that Mordecai has decided only belongs to God. And so as a result, a law is passed because of Mordecai's obstinance, his refusal to bow. And this law is not just to harm Mordecai. This law now is racially profiling every Jew. There is an ethnic stereotyping going on, an ethnic cleansing in the making because one man has offended someone else. And now that has been broadened to everyone who is of his ethnic ethnic origin. Mordecai understands that now it is the time to come out of hiding. Mordecai understands that it is time for the lions to rise up. So he goes to Esther and he says to her, I told you to hide, but I need you now to identify with others. I need you to know that this is not just about your own safety and your own security and and making yourself successful. It is not about these things, Esther. People's lives are on the line. And so in Esther chapter four, verses 15 and 16, Queen Esther says this, She says, gather up all the Jews who are in Susa and tell them to give up eating to help me be brave. They aren't to eat or drink anything for three whole days, says Esther. And I myself will do the same. 
along with my female servants. You see, in this moment, Esther is now discovering the truth that she is indeed a lion. She's not the scared little girl that she thinks she is. She's Ezer because the daughter of a lion is herself a lion. That's why I find it so appropriate to be the speaker for this year's lecture entitled Living into the Legacy because I am honored to be one of the spiritual daughters of the great lion, Dr. John M. Perkins. I can still remember the first time I met him. I was a student at Fuller Theological Seminary. He and his family were living in Northwest Pasadena. I was living in Pasadena as well. And his neighborhood, Northwest Pasadena, was a neighborhood that at the time had the highest daytime crime rate in California. And it was there that Dr. John Perkins chose to live and established the Harambe Christian Family Center. I took college students there often to do what the John Perkins Center does now today, give college students experience with real live people in real live situations, getting their hands involved in the work of justice and reconciliation up close and personal. I've known his family since probably now 30 some years. And it's been a wonderful thing to watch this father of the Christian community development movement practice the principles that he preaches. Amen, somebody. He lives by what he preaches. And so when I watched him in Northwest Pasadena being John Perkins, knowing all the neighbors, growing vegetables in his yard and talking to the kids on the back porch and all of those things, I saw that he lives in the neighborhood with the people that he seeks to serve. He wants to be with the people to help them solve problems and to meet their needs in their communities. So these are not just books that Dr. Parkins writes. This is a life well lived and he documents his life in the books that he writes. And so let me tell you this, in addition to his fierce intention to live what he practices. He loves the word of God like no one I've ever met. I can still remember the first day Dr. Perkins came to Fuller to lead a Bible study. It, the Bible study was on John chapter four. He expounded on this biblical passage in a way that I had never heard before, ever. I'm telling you, the hermeneutical approach to John four was almost mind blowing to me. I listened and realized as I was hearing him explain these scriptures that my gosh, up until that point, now I'm a seminary student. I had never heard that text preached from anything other than an evangelistic perspective. Namely, that the woman in the story was a sinner and a public outcast because of her questionable moral character and Jesus came to the well to save her so she could have eternal life. Ta-da. That was basically all I'd ever heard. But as I listened to Dr. Perkins and his exposition of this text, I realized that it was the very first time that someone had unpacked the social and cultural aspects of this biblical passage. It was life-changing for me. So much so that as Kanisha read the various books that I've written, one of them is called A Credible Witness, and it's based completely on John chapter four. The reconciliation principles that I have learned from watching Dr. Perkins and being introduced to a profoundly relevant text, because the Bible says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So if we want to see what reconciliation looks like, we must look at the life of Christ. And there is no better text to expound upon the work of reconciliation through the life of Jesus Christ than this interaction with the woman at the well of Samaria. I learned that from Dr. John Perkins. I learned also that this is what Dr. Perkins means by the biblical commission that we preach the whole gospel. He talks about it a lot. And I teach about it in my classes here at SPU. 
When he talks about the whole gospel, he makes it very clear in his book, Let Justice Roll Down, that this is what it means. And this is why he cares so much that we, the people of God, preach not just with our words, but with our lives, the whole gospel. Here's a quote from Let Justice Roll Down. He says this, one of the greatest tra tragedies of the civil rights movement is that evangelicals surrendered their leadership in the movement by default to those with either a bankrupt theology or no theology at all, simply because the vast majority of Bible-believing Christians ignored a great and crucial opportunity in history for genuine ethical action. The evangelical church had not gone to had not gone on to preach the whole gospel. We must hear these words even today and what it is that they mean for us in the situation in which we find ourselves. Are we the people of God living into the legacy of John Perkins and preaching the whole gospel? And if we do, I'm here to tell you like Esther, we will discover that we are taking a risk to stand up and speak out about injustice, especially in, in the face of the silence of the church. We will get in trouble when we begin to stand up and speak truth to the king. He, John Perkins, knew that when we raise our voice for the voiceless and take a stand against the oppression and systems that weaken and abuse others, it will always involve the possibility of personal risk. I wish it, wish it was not so, but it is. And unfortunately, Dr. Perkins experienced the horror of this when he was tortured in a Mississippi jail. And he vividly describes what Ashley referred to in her reading from Let Justice Roll Down. And I wanna give you the larger version of it because he graphically describes the risk that he endured for the sake of reconciliation. He says this, and I quote, when they started torturing us, it was horrifying. I couldn't even imagine that this was happening. One of the officers took a fork that was bent down and he brought that fork up to me and he said, have you seen this? And he took that fork and put that fork into my nose. Then he took that fork and pushed it down my throat. And then he took me over there and beat me to the ground. They were like savages, like some horror out of the night. And I can't forget their faces, so twisted with hate. It was like looking at white-faced demons. Hate did that to them. But you know, I couldn't hate them back. When I saw what hate had done to them, I couldn't hate back. I could only pity them. I didn't ever want hate to do to me what it, what it had already done to those men. My siblings, this is what re a reconciliation leader sounds like. He refused to return evil for evil, but chose to love his enemies and pray for those who spitefully abused him. Dr. Perkins knows that when we dehumanize others, we dehumanize ourselves. And so he has dedicated himself to the way and the ethic of love, justice, and reconciliation instead. And he is calling us to do the same. That's what it means to live into the legacy of Dr. John Perkins. So I am thrilled that the daughters of a lion Priscilla and Elizabeth Perkins will continue his life's work as the co-presidents of the John and Vera Mae Perkins Foundation because they now will come to know that the daughters of a lion are also a lion. Like Esther, they've observed their father fiercely stand for justice and equality in the face of opposition and have been nurtured to do the same. I truly believe that there is a need in this day for such a time as this, for the collaborative community building power of women to counteract the divisive and destructive energy that is so pervasive in our world today. 
women and especially women of color must be encouraged and supported in positions of leadership. Our experience of oppression has given us clarity into how things must change. If we are really going to pursue reconciliation, if we are really looking for reconciliation leaders, we must look among the marginalized, the disenfranchised and vulnerable in any society and culture, because they are the ones who push. They are the ones who prod. They are the ones who poke people to move toward equality and freedom. Can you say amen? Like Queen Esther, women have decided to be brave and take our rightful place as the warriors that God has created us to be in order to repair the world. I pray that a new sense of unity and collaboration will emerge that leads to innovation, innovative strategies, promoting our collective survival. Many women are in the process even now of creating new things. And I pray that women will birth creative and subversive strategies that cultivate solidarity and communion rather than replicating the ego-driven competitive approaches demonstrated by many of our male predecessors. As we follow their leadership, women who are standing for justice and reconciliation, I pray that we will find the courage to pursue racial justice that we will become brave enough knowing that our collaborative efforts can help reclaim the credibility of our Christian witness as we repair broken systems in a world that has lost confidence in the relevance of the church. This is our moment of destiny. This is our Kairos moment. This is our time to choose like Esther if we indeed will speak truth to the king the powers that be, the unjust laws and system that are causing people's lives to be destroyed. And if we do, I pray that we will move from this place, that this lectureship will be a catalyst for us to move us forward as brave agents of reconciliation, supporting the leadership of women as a tangible way to continue the life's work of Dr. John Perkins, knowing that the daughters of a lion are also lions and have been called to the kingdom for such a time as this. May it be so, I pray in Jesus' name. Thank you and amen. May the words of the Reverend Dr. Brenda Salter McNeil and Dr. John Perkins change us and move us. Today, our benediction uh, comes from the Reverend Dr. Brenda Salter McNeil's book, Becoming Brave. So community, may you receive this today. May the Holy Spirit indwell us and bring conviction and empower us to move. She says, this is our unique role as we continue in the work of reconciliation. We must live into our call as the people of God who are entrusted with the ministry of reconciliation. We are reconcilers. Author Austin Channing Brown captures our powerful and prophetic mission in this declaration. So may you receive this today. We are reconcilers. We are a collective of change agents. Bored by easy answers, we wrestle with hard questions. We understand history can speak prophetically. We push ourselves purposefully. We read voraciously, listen intentionally. We act in solidarity. Often called troublemakers, we interrupt the status quo. We work to uproot white supremacy. We hold power accountable, believing in the possibility of change, working to dismantle unjust systems, we drag injustice into the light. We make peace. We promote truth and love above politeness and civility. 
We make noise because our lives depend on it. We believe in reconciliation. We recognize justice comes first. We know God is working in this world. We celebrate, we laugh, we honor one another. We practice joy. Making room for grief, we cultivate hope. We believe in redemption and resurrection. We are confident in love's victory. Will you pray with me? God, we draw near to you today, and God, let us also draw near to one another. God, I am truly grateful for the words, for the truth that you have spoken through the Reverend Dr. Brenda Salter McNeil. God, I pray that you would continue to open our hearts to unpack them, that your Holy Spirit would do your redemptive work in us, would change what we see and empower us to move. God, I was struck by the truth that she proclaimed to see lives outside of the palace, to help the king to see people's humanity and that people are made in the image of God. God, I believe that there are many things that whether we are um, a part of our community here at SPU or we are doing work in the city of Seattle or you have called us to places across the nation to do your good work. Spirit, will you change these things in us and empower us to preach your whole gospel? May the words of Dr. Perkins that empower us to live and incarnate this ethic of love make you known and bring justice to places that have been unjust. God, I also pray and echo the prayers of the Reverend Dr. Brenda Salter McNeil when she prays for women who have been empowered and called into these places and for the generations that are to come. God, would you continue to move and give vision and speak your truth in these places? God, will you change what we see Will you birth new vision, vision that brings a collective support, that brings new ways of dismantling injustice in the structures and the systems that we live? God, I pray that you would also go before us and that you would break down and make a way for us to step into these places. God, I pray for those that will come around and will empower and open up doors for us to move into these places. Holy Spirit, would we lean on you and trust that you are at work in this and that you are moving in us. God, in these places, um, would you bring forth your love abounding in ways beyond our own imagination? God, would you enable us to become brave more and more in these spaces and to live in the ways that you have called us to do your good kingdom work. So God, help us to offer ourselves to you and to one another in this place. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. We look forward to having you join us for the rest of our events for this lecture series this week. We'll see you next time.